I'm going to talk today about a, a topic that uh, is really an exciting area of neurology on autoimmune encephalopathy. There's really been huge advances over the years, and this is treatable neurological conditions for the most part. So it's a pretty exciting area. So uh, these are my disclosures, um, but they're not really relevant to the talk today. So the learning objectives, uh, I'll discuss a little bit about the diagnostic criteria for, um, and the epidemiology of autoimmune encephalitis. I'll then discuss a little bit about antibodies to cell surface antigens, and then some antibodies to intracellular antigens and the difference in approach and difference in syndromes associated with those. And then I'll discuss a little bit about the expanding spectrum of autoimmune encephalitis beyond the typical perineoplastic disease. So encephalitis has a large disease burden. These patients are often very sick in the hospital for a long period of time, so up to $2 billion in costs in the USA in 2010. Uh, traditionally, it was thought that the vast majority of causes of uh, encephalitis were viruses, but in recent years, we've begun to recognize with the discovery of neural autoantibodies that autoimmune encephalitis represents an important proportion of patients with encephalitis. Uh, this is a, an article from Neurology by um, uh, Stacy Clardy and uh, Sebastian Lopez. And this just shows here, you can see, uh, if I show with the mouse here, you can see the uh, rapid uh, discovery of many uh, antibodies over the years. So it started off with straight muscle antibody and um, uh, myasthenia gravis muscle so acetylcholine receptor antibody. And then you can see over the last couple of decades, there's been an explosion in the discovery of neural autoantibodies led by Dr. Joseph Dalmau and his group in Barcelona. And many of these are associated with encephalitis, and I'll try and focus on some of these today, particularly the most uh, relevant ones and how we approach uh, these patients. So this was a nice article published in The Lancet Neurology um, by Grouse and colleagues from the Dalmau group, and it was an international consortium uh, for the diagnostic criteria for autoimmune encephalitis. And here you can see the typical patients that we think about are patients who have a subacute onset of uh, mental status changes, psychiatric difficulties, memory problems. And then they'll usually have focal CNS findings or may have a seizure. Uh, they'll often have an inflammatory spinal fluid or MRI changes suggestive of encephalitis. And in this uh, uh, article, they categorize the different encephalitis types into limbic encephalitis acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, anti-NMDA receptor antibodies, uh, Bickerstaff's encephalitis, and then antibody positive specific disease, Hashimoto's encephalopathy, and then antibody negative probable autoimmune encephalitis. And I'll go through antibody negative a little bit later. And this is a study that we uh, looked at in our county, Olmsted County, is a very useful uh, area to study the epidemiology of disease because Mayo Clinic and Olmsted Medical Center, there's just two medical centers there and the population is fairly stable. So many epidemiology studies have been done in the study of disease, including neurological diseases. So we looked um, uh, through the Rochester Epidemiology Project. We searched for patients who had encephalitis and we wanted to see how common autoimmune encephalitis was and compare that to infectious encephalitis. And we tested the antibodies through our neuroimmunology lab. So in the results of this study, we found a, a similar prevalence of autoimmune and infectious encephalitis. And what we also found, which was interesting, was that the, f the incidence of autoimmune encephalitis was increasing over time. So here you can see from 1995 to 2005, the incidence was 0.4 um, uh, per 100,000, and then uh, it increased to 1.2 here. And you can see here infectious encephalitis kind of stayed fairly static. And that was mostly driven by antibody discovery. So these patients are now being recognized and we're able to test for the neural autoantibodies. This is an example of some of the cases in this study. This was a patient with MOG antibodies that I'll talk a little bit about later. It is a patient with GFAP antibodies with this characteristic radial enhancement. Uh, this was a patient with um, uh, herpes simplex encephalitis virus and HHV6. So I think the conclusions from this study were that autoimmune encephalitis and um, infectious encephalitis may have a similar frequency. Now I will say there are some caveats to this because we use the diagnostic criteria for 
autoimmune encephalitis, which does not require an antibody, but um, for infectious etiologies, we required an infection confirmed. And we also didn't have next generation sequencing and other things. So that may change. But I think the bottom line of our study was that autoimmune encephalitis is increasingly recognized over time. And that our study estimated that up to a million people may have had autoimmune encephalitis and 90,000 per year may develop um, autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, there have been prior studies. Uh, the Dalmau group did look at patients from the California Encephalitis Project. And when they looked at younger patients there, they found that NMDA receptor encephalitis was um, quite frequent and rivaled that of viral encephalitis. There was a nationwide study also in the UK that showed that um, uh, uh, 42 or 21% of patients had uh, autoimmune encephalitis of, uh, of encephalitis etiology. So um, certainly we're starting to recognize this more and more and it's something that's potentially treatable. Okay, so this is a complicated uh, slide, but I'll try and uh, just explain it because I think it helps uh, give an insight into how uh, these disorders develop. So if we focus on the red side of the picture here, uh, these are antibodies to cell surface antigens. So here you can see the um, antigen on the cell surface and the antibody binding here. So this would be things like NMDA receptor antibodies, aquaporin 4 IgG MOG antibodies. And um, uh, these antibodies can be produced in uh, uh, association with a tumor uh, in relation to antigens from that and then bind to nervous system tissue. And sometimes the downstream effect is that the uh, receptor is internalized and then the receptor can come back up to the surface if you can treat that disease and patients can have quite a good recovery like an NMDA receptor encephalitis. And the treatments for the, this side where the antibody binds to the cell surface antigen are things like plasma exchange where you can remove the antibodies, potentially rituximab where you can prevent antibody production. On the contrary, here on the green side, you have antibodies to intracellular antigens that are unlikely to be pathogenic. So the other, the red antibodies are likely to be pathogenic because they bind directly to the cell surface uh, antigen and have the potential at least to be pathogenic. Um, but on the other side, the green side, they bind to intracellular antigens. They're often associated with cancer. There's a higher frequency of cancer and they tend to respond less well to immunotherapy. Uh, so less well to treatments like plasma exchange. But there are uh, nonetheless, they are a good marker of uh, autoimmune or paraneoplastic encephalitis and can help uh, give you an indication of an underlying cancer. So you'll see as I go through the talk, I'll split into cell surface markers and then intracellular antigens. So just talking about antibodies to cell surface antigens, um, I'm going to start with a case here. And this is a patient that I saw, a 74-year-old man who presented with subacute encephalopathy. And in association with this, this patient had briefs. Uh, jerking spells on the right side where his uh, right face and arm would jerk. This would happen up to 30 times per hour. His awareness was preserved during those episodes but he also had two episodes where it sounded more suspicious for a, a seizure with loss of awareness or complex partial seizure. Uh, this patient had been placed on many anti-epileptic medications but they had not improved his um, or not resolved his symptoms. His um, short test of mental status score, the Kochman that we do in Rochester, was 20 out of 38. And he was noted in the office to have some myoclonic movements of the right arm. Uh, there was accompanying hyponatremia. And the EEG um, showed some central spikes and captured a couple of these episodes of uh, jerking that were without EEG correlate. Um, this patient had an elevated, mildly elevated white cell count and elevated protein. And on um, MRI, there was some T1 hyperintensity within the basal ganglia that hopefully you can see here. Um, so this patient was tested for LGI-1 autoantibodies and they uh, came back positive in the serum. So the diagnosis here was anti-LGI-1 antibody encephalitis associated with facio-brachial dystonic seizures. And I'll show an example in a moment. Uh, so this patient was treated with IV steroids followed by a prolonged oral steroid taper and had a dramatic improvement in these episodes and resolution of his seizures. So this is, uh, I'll show this video here. This shows just a typical episode because these are very stereotyped. They look very similar across different patients. So I'll, uh, I'll just play this video here. Let's see. So 
So maybe if I uh, come back to the start here, you can just uh, focus on the left face and the arm. So you can see this dystonic posturing of the um, of the uh, left arm and um, on, of the face that are very characteristic of these facio-brachial dystonic seizures. Um, some of these can be misdiagnosed. Uh, the most recent patient I saw was diagnosed as a tic disorder, a new onset adult tic disorder, because he didn't have any encephalitis. He just had uh, episodic jerks of the of the arm, and it can be important to detect early on because you may prevent the encephalitis episode from occurring. Uh, some of them have been diagnosed as um, paroxysmal dyskinesias or as psychiatric non-epileptic behavioral episodes. Um, just as a caution, uh, in this disease, the CSF can be non-inflammatory, so you may have a normal cell count, um, so that may not give you a clue. The serum is the best way to test for this, so um, uh, CSF is not as sensitive, so you may miss it if you just do CSF, and the treatment is corticosteroids. And this was an article from the Oxford group from Dr. Arani and colleagues who described this disorder. And here you can see the patients, uh, the proportion of patients with ongoing seizures uh, who have facial brachial dystonic seizures with anti-epileptic medications. They don't really have much of a response, but once you add in immunotherapy, you have a dramatic reduction in um, uh, the number of seizures. And again, I think rather than IVIG, in my experience, corticosteroids, IV or oral corticosteroids is the mainstay of treatment. And if you get in early, when they have the jerks, you may prevent them developing encephalitis. Uh, this was a study we did uh, in a, a small proportion of patients. You'll sometimes see signal abnormalities within the basal ganglia, either T2 or T1 hyperintensities that are often opposite uh, to where the, uh, these episodes occurred. It's, there's a suspicion that these may arise from deep structures. We usually think of seizures occurring from the cortex, but there's some suspicion that these may arise in the basal ganglia, and some of these imaging abnormalities are part of uh, that suspicion. So um, many of you might know that uh, about a decade ago, it was initially thought that these antibodies bound to the potassium channel. So there was a description of potassium channel antibody encephalitis. But we now know that actually the antibodies bind to ant uh, antigens or, uh, that associate, or proteins that associate with the channel. So here you can see LGI1 here and Casper2, and they don't bind directly to the channel themselves. Um, and the, the LGI1 and Casper2 are the most useful of the antibodies uh, associated with limbic encephalitis and facial brachial dystonic seizures for LGI1, and then Casper2 can be associated with neuromyotonia or limbic encephalitis or Morvan syndrome. Uh, but when the antibody does not bind to LGI1 or Casper2, it seems that the antibody is not as useful. So if you have VGKC positivity, but uh, it does not bind to LGI1 or Casper2, then it does not seem to be a marker of autoimmune inflammation, and it should be kind of seen similar to an ANA, kind of um, a marker of autoimmunity, but not suggestive of autoimmune encephalitis. So LGI1 and Casper2 is really where you want to be uh, in looking at these disorders. Yeah, most of them are also voltage-gated potassium channel. The problem is, is that um, only probably 10 to 20 percent are LGI1 and Casper2. The other 80 percent are a range of disorders that don't really have a good uh, response to treatment. So I think you need the LGI1 and Casper2 um, uh, being more important. We use it. Uh, we used to use it to screen because it's a it's a cheaper test and easier to do. Uh, but we've moved now to doing it in our autoimmune encephalopathy panel in every patient. We do LGI1 and Casper2. So kind of the, the, the landscape is changing in terms of how we use these antibodies because some of them can uh, risk false positives and downstream effects that I'll talk about later. Okay, so the next patient, this is another patient that I saw, a 47-year-old man when I joined the staff at uh, Mayo Clinic. He was in our neural IC, neuro ICU. He presented with a viral illness. He had subacute encephalopathy and headache over days and then developed a rapidly progressive myelopathy that was very severe to the point where he was... When he came to us, he was comatose, quadriplegic, intubated, and had upgoing plantar responses. Um, his CSF was inflammatory with a lymphocytic pleocytosis. Um, his glucose was normal and oligoclonal bands were negative. And this was the MRI here. You can see these fluffy, patchy infiltrates within the brain that are suspicious for an ADEM-like phenomenon, but he was uh, 47. And here you can see a longitudinally extensive lesion within the cord that tends to involve more the gray matter, which is something we uh, tend to see with this disorder. 
So he actually, this was before we had uh, MOG antibodies or myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibodies available. So uh, we were doing them on a research basis, but not very often. So he ended up having a brain biopsy that showed features consistent with ADEM. And when the antibody came back, it was high titer. Um, so we diagnosed him with MOG IgG associated demyelinating disease. He was treated with IV steroids and plasma exchange, and then he had a prolonged oral steroid taper. And he came back to me three months later in the clinic, and he was normal. Brain MRI had returned to normal. So an excellent response. This is an antibody to a cell surface antigen. They have better responses. Uh, he did relapse with an optic neuritis as we tapered his steroids, and he was placed on steroid-sparing immunosuppression. But these can be very gratifying because you get a, a really good uh, improvement with uh, treatment. Uh, so MOG antibodies have a long history in MS. Uh, there was a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that uh, initially thought that these antibodies might be a marker of MS. Uh, the interest has been because the MOG antigen is on the surface of oligodendrocytes, making it a potential uh, area where a pathogenic antibody could uh, initiate demyelination. But um, these initial studies uh, were not replicated, and they were using less reliable techniques with Western blot and ELISA and did not use MOG in its conformational epitope. Um, so when you actually use a cell-based assay, uh, like we use for aquaporin 4 IgG, where we uh, first um, uh, utilize that, um, it does this define a syndrome that seems to be distinct from MS. And um, it probably accounts for 30 to 50% of ADEM cases. And in addition, uh, it can be associated with recurrent optic neuritis, single optic neuritis, uh, transverse myelitis, or it's been reported with a hemicortical encephalitis also. And the majority of the relapses are in the optic nerves. So patients may initially present with ADEM, transverse myelitis, or optic neuritis, and then the majority of relapses will be in the optic nerve. So they don't tend to get recurrent episodes of transverse myelitis. They more uh, go on to develop optic neuritis. Um, there have been studies, uh, as I mentioned, MOG IgG is found in 30 to 50% of ADEM cases. Aquaporin 4 IgG is also an antibody you want to consider testing in ADEM uh, patients in children. Uh, it probably accounts for about 5% or so. And then um, there has been some interest in, um, uh, because we know that many ADEM cases have a monophasic course, um, there has been an interest in MOG IgG persistence, because if you repeat the testing down the line six months later, those patients seem to be at higher risk of relapse. So in some patients, what they will have ADEM, the MOG antibody will be positive, they'll have a monophasic course, and when you repeat the testing six months later, the antibody will be negative. Uh, on the other hand, if the antibody is still positive, they're at higher risk of relapse. And if they have a higher titer at the first presentation, they're at higher risk of relapse. And this is a study from a biomarker study group in Europe published in Neurology showing that. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to NMDA receptor encephalitis, which is kind of the prototypic um, autoimmune encephalitis that was um, discovered uh, in the mid-2000s. Uh, this tends to affect young women. Uh, they can present with a psychiatric presentation. So this might be a patient you're referred for, to see for psychosis in the psychiatric unit of the hospital. And they will often have oromandibular dyskinesia, so they'll have abnormal facial movements. They can progress to develop hypoventilation, seizures, and uh, more typical encephalitis. It's often associated with ovarian teratoma. And this is best, in contrast to LGI-1 antibodies, this is best tested in the CSF. Um, the cell-based assay is the most sensitive in the CSF. The MRI is variable. Sometimes the MRI will be normal. Sometimes it can have signal abnormalities within the limbic lobes. And the EEG pattern shows this um, uh, delta with superimposed beta on top, superimposed fast activity. That's been described as extreme uh, delta brush pattern, which seems to be suggestive of uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis. And this is what we see under the microscope. We see this hippocampus lighting up very brightly when a patient's um, CSF is applied to mouse tissue. OK. So in terms of uh, diagno diagnostic workup in these patients, so one of the first steps is to look for a, a teratoma. So we, we do a transvaginal ultrasound, an MRI or a CT. And then if the teratoma is present, we'll recommend that that be resected, as that seems to be associated with better outcomes. In contrast to the LGI-1 antibody, where within five days of IV steroids, the patients will often be back to normal or have a dramatic response, the response to this disorder takes much longer. So patients are often put on methylprednisolone five, for five days, and then we usually give a weekly uh, treatment course of that. We'll usually use IVIG or plasma exchange, and we'll often use rituximab uh, in addition. 
Uh, cyclophosphamide is a little bit problematic because it causes infertility, and these are usually young women, so we try not to use that unless the patients are really unwell. Um, the prognosis is often good, so these patients can, from being in the ICU, return to you in your clinic, return to work, so you just got to stick with them, but they can develop complications along the way, like any patient who has a prolonged hospitalization. They often have a long time in the ICU. They can develop DVTs, etc. Okay. Another antibody that I just want to mention is GABA B receptor encephalitis. And this, um, in contrast to the other antibodies, this often presents with status epilepticus. So uh, patients come in um, uh, with status epilepticus. It's common in smokers, and it's associated with small cell lung cancer. Uh, the treatment uh, is generally treat the cancer, and we'll use aggressive immunotherapy because, again, it's an antibody to a cell surface marker, tends to respond well to immunotherapy. So um, it's another important one to look out for in your patients with new onset status epilepticus. Um, this is one of the most common in that situation. Okay, another case I want to mention, this is a 70-year-old lady that I saw last December, and she presented with uh, rapid memory loss and disorientation. Uh, it was a bit more uh, subacute than we would think of for things like Alzheimer's disease, where it would be insidious coming on over years. Um, she had a history of smoking, a 20-pack year history, and um, her memory loss had come on over the course of a couple of months. Interestingly, her MRI of her head was normal and her CSF was normal, um, but she was found to be AMPA receptor antibody positive. So she had a kind of a rapidly progressive dementia, which is a scenario where you want to think about testing this, uh, these antibodies. Um, here you can see she had a large uh, lung cancer that proved to be small cell lung cancer, and uh, the patient improved with steroid treatment. Again, this is an antibody to a cell surface antigen, tends to respond well to uh, treatment. Uh, so this just shows you that these patients can present with a rapidly progressive dementia rather than a typical encephalitis type picture, and that's something to consider if the dementia is subacute or rapid, or if there's some other atypical features for degenerative etiologies, because you don't want to test uh, patients who have uh, slow, insidious uh, neurodegenerative type disorders for these antibodies. Another antibody just to mention is called DPPX. Uh, this one is interesting in that it's associated with severe episodes of weight loss. So it's um, uh, one of the potassium channels that uh, it binds to. And this potassium channel is found in the gut, in the myenteric plexus. So patients can have episodes of severe weight loss and um, up to 20 or 30 kilograms uh, at a time. Um, they present with uh, a low-grade encephalitis. They can have uh, PERM, progressive encephalomyelitis, rigidity, and myoclonus. They can have brainstem. Yeah? yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, would the AMPA look a lot like CJD, and is the AMPA the standard? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it is not. So you're better off ordering, and there's been some recent studies on this, you're better off ordering syndromic panels. So the, this is on the autoimmune dementia. We have an autoimmune dementia and an autoimmune encephalopathy panel, which are, uh, include the AMPA receptor. Now, sometimes we will see them anyway on our perineoplastic, but the cell-based assays we don't do automatically, and the cell-based assays sometimes have greater sensitivity. So you may miss NMDA if you order a perineoplastic kind of thing. Yeah, it could look like CJD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's one to think about. I suppose, you know, um, in a rapidly progressive dementia, it's a scenario where you want to think about testing these antibodies. In an insidious dementia, you don't want to test them because you'll get into trouble with false positives, as I'll talk about later, kind of thing. Yeah, but excellent point, yeah. And these tend to respond, again, well to immunotherapy and occasionally are associated with hematological malignancy. So the weight loss is uh, the discriminating feature here, which is uh, quite interesting. And some other pearls, uh, just to mention about antibodies to cell surface uh, proteins, there is a GABA-A receptor antibody that tends to have somewhat of an MS-like presentation. They can have cortical and subcortical white matter changes. It's often in children, um, and it's something um, we don't offer currently at Mayo Clinic, but we'll usually see it on the panel and call the doctors, and it's something we're looking to add to our uh, panel down the line. m 5 is another antibody that's... Um, is associated with limbic encephalitis and Hodgkin's lymphoma. So lots of new antibodies, hard to keep up with them all. Um, IGLAN-5 is an interesting antibody that's associated with a sleep disorder, but pathologically these patients have uh, tau pathology and they tend to respond poorly to immunotherapy. So it's kind of an overlap of a neurodegenerative and autoimmune process, but they don't tend to respond well to treatment. 
And then if you have a patient with progressive encephalomyelitis, rigidity, or myoclonus, you want to think about testing GAD65 and glycine receptor antibodies. Some of these we offer on a research basis, so if you're interested in testing them, you can email our lab or contact our lab and we can get it added on. Okay, I'm just going to mention some intracellular antigens and then we'll move on to the kind of expanding spectrum. Um, so there, in young men uh, with testicular tumors, there's an antibody to uh, MA2 um, that was first described by the Dalmau group in 1999. And these have uh, clinical syndromes of limbic encephalitis, uh, brainstem encephalitis, or a diencephalic syndrome with narcolepsy or cataplexy. This is uh, not on the Mayo Clinic panel, so it's something you might need to send as a separate test. Uh, I think Athena Diagnostics and other, others do it because um, there's patenting issues. But uh, it's something to think about if you have a young man with um, autoimmune encephalitis or a, kind of a diencephalic syndrome with narcolepsy, cataplexy. This is a patient I saw who had these peri third ventricular signal abnormalities. So something to think about in uh, young men um, and think about doing a testicular ultrasound in young men too who, uh, who you think of a paraneoplastic process because sometimes you won't pick that up on conventional screening. Um, another antibody that we recently uh, uh, described was an antibody to GFAP. Uh, this was by Dr. Lennon and colleagues in our lab who noticed that these patients who had a meningoencephalomyelitis um, uh, had antibodies to the uh, GFAP, which is a known uh, astrocytic marker in the, um, in the central nervous system. Uh, the patients can have tremor and optic disc edema, which can be a clinical clue. This is best tested in the CSF, and sometimes they'll have coexisting antibodies and they tend to respond to steroids. And the MRI is often quite dramatic. You can see here these radial perivascular enhancement uh, that you can see with this disorder. That's a clue to this antibody being present. And this is something we offer again on a research uh, basis right now. I will say that this is not pathognomonic for this. So that I've seen, I had a patient this week who I think has lymphoma who had perivascular enhancement. It's been described with sarcoidosis and with vasculitis. But if you see the pattern and you think about it, it might be worth uh, testing the antibody. Um, other antibodies to intracellular antigens, CRIMP5 IgG can be associated with an autoimmune chorea. Uh, so uh, this can be a movement disorder presentation. Um, ANA1 or anti hu can be associated with a pseudo obstruction like an Ogilvy syndrome. So you want to um, uh, think about that. And then ANA2 has kind of quite a characteristic manifestation of opsoclonus, myoclonus, jaw dystonia, and laryngospasm. So that's kind of, there's some differencing differentiating features for some of these antibodies, but there is a lot of overlap. It's very difficult even for me to keep up with all these antibodies and the different syndromes. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about some cautions I I with antibody positivity. So just remember there is um, Hashimoto's encephalitis has been out there a long time, which is associated with thyroid antibodies, but thyroid antibodies are present in 20% of the general population. So this is not a good marker of autoimmune encephalitis. Um, some of the other antibodies on our panel, the PQ, the N-type calcium channel, the ganglionic acetylcholine receptor antibody can be seen in up to 5% of the general population. So if you have a patient who has, uh, who has an encephalitis and comes back with one of these antibodies positive at low level um, or even at high level sometimes, um, it may just be a red herring because they are present in the uh, general population and we don't generally do cancer screening in these patients unless they have high risk factors for, uh, like they have a long history of smoking, we'll look at a CT chest. But otherwise, we don't generally uh, do that. We are moving more towards newer generation assays, so cell-based assays, like I mentioned with the MOG, the Acroporin-4, the NMDA. And the false positivity rate with these is much less, is 0.2%. So uh, there are some assay improvements, and we're always trying to improve our, um, uh, the assays on our panel and get more specificity. Sometimes the titers may help you. So GAD65 antibodies are a useful marker of autoimmune encephalitis, but they're present in up to 8% of the general population, and they're also a marker of diabetes. But when they're very high titer, such as greater than 20 nanomoles per liter, or if they're positive in the CSF, it's a useful marker of stiff person syndrome and of autoimmune encephalitis or autoimmune ataxia. So sometimes the titers can help you. And then make sure, be sure to send prior to immunotherapy. So, um, uh, the IVIG, um, you, if you send after IVIG, it may cause a false positive. And antibodies need to be put into clinical context. So a positive antibody should never replace your clinical judgment. So if an antibody p comes back positive, but it doesn't fit with the clinical situation, you need to use your clinical judgment kind of thing. Okay. 
And I'm going to move on now to seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. Um, so in the diagnostic criteria that I mentioned earlier, uh, to meet criteria for seronegative autoimmune encephalitis, um, they're quite stringent. Again, you need to have this kind of subacute memory difficulties, psych psychosis or altered mental status. Um, you need to not have a, a well-defined other category. And then you need to um, uh, have uh, MRI abnormalities suggestive of autoimmune encephalitis, CSF pleocytosis, or a brain biopsy showing uh, inflammatory infiltrates. So um, you want to be careful with seronegative autoimmune encephalitis because there's lots of different things out there that, that are much more common that can cause encephalopathy or psychosis. So you have to be careful in that situation. So a couple of things to ask yourself if you do see a patient and you're suspicious it's seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. The first question is, um, you could contact our laboratory if you're very suspicious because sometimes we'll see an unclassified antibody that's not yet been described. So 20 years ago, Dr. Lennon was seeing on her tissue uh, staining suggestive of NMDA receptor encephalitis, but we didn't know what it meant at that time. But sometimes we could give the doctor a heads up that there's something going on there that might be suggestive of an autoimmune cause. The other thing you might want to check was, was it sent after immunotherapy? So if the patient had plasma exchange and then you tested in the middle of their plasma exchange, it's likely to be negative. And then did you send the correct sample? So serum is best for LGI-1, as I mentioned. CSF is better for NMDA receptor encephalitis. And our laboratory is happy to, uh, if you call us, we can help uh, guide people uh, on that. Because you may miss it if you test a NMDA only on the uh, only on the serum, or if you do a serum paraneoplastic rather than autoimmune encephalitis panel, you may miss NMDA receptor antibodies. And then uh, always the question is, is another diagnosis more likely? So if you do have a, a seronegative result, you know, there are many causes, toxic metabolic, uh, psychiatric disease. We see many patients who have psychiatric disease or psychosis, and things like schizophrenia and other diseases are much more common than autoimmune encephalitis, so you have to be aware of that. Um, uh, neurodegenerative disorders also are more common. So um, infectious uh, disorders, as I mentioned, is now next generation sequencing available, which can be helpful in the uh, evaluation of that. And then we often get patients who, have, who do not have encephalopathy, but who have positive TPO antibodies. They might have fibromyalgia, they might be on multiple medications, have somewhat of a brain fog. And it's important not to diagnose those with uh, autoimmune encephalopathy and indeed not order an autoimmune encephalopathy panel in those patients. Um, if the cell count, CSF cell count is normal and they have no oligoclonal bands, that might be a red flag that it's not autoimmune, although there are many exceptions to that. Or if the MRI shows moderate or severe atrophy um, in the setting of autoimmune encephalitis without prior signal abnormalities, then that would be uh, somewhat atypical. Uh, in seronegative autoimmune encephalitis, generally, if I'm not sure, I'll consider a short trial of steroids sometimes as a diagnostic test. So we'll do one gram of intravenous methylprednisolone once a day for five days, and maybe once a week for six weeks. And then we'll try and look at objective measures of response. So we might recheck the CSF, check the MRI, uh, repeat the EEG, do a seizure diary, just to see if we've objective, and repeat the memory test and neuropsychiatric uh, testing um, to see if you are getting a definite response. Because uh, a couple of things are, one is that other diseases can respond to steroids, so lymphoma can reduce in size with steroids. And then steroids kind of can cause somewhat of a euphoria and patients can feel that they feel a little bit stronger, a little bit better with a blast of steroids, but it's not really a true response. So you want to measure some of these things to help gauge if it is truly an autoimmune encephalitis. Okay, so the last section of the talk is just going to be the expanding spectrum of autoimmune encephalitis, and this is really an exciting area. And we'll focus on post-infectious uh, disorders, post-medication, and uh, post-transplant. So this is a nice paper from just this year from the Dalmau group, and they looked at uh, autoimmune encephalitis after herpes simplex uh, virus encephalitis. So uh, for many years, uh, it's been known that patients who had HSV encephalitis could have a relapse, and those patients were tested for HSV PCR, and it would be negative, and they would be treated for additional acyclovir treatment. But now what it seems like is that these patients likely had autoimmune encephalitis. And when you follow the patients prospectively, 27% developed autoimmune encephalitis after herpes uh, encephalitis, so quite common. Many of these had NMDA receptor antibodies or other antibodies, and it usually occurs within the first few months of HSV encephalitis. So what will happen is you will give them the acyclovir and then they will relapse. They may have new gadolinium enhancement or signal abnormalities on their MRI. 
Uh, in children, if this occurs, it more commonly has a chorioatitosis, intractable seizures, and can include infantile spasms, and these have a poor prognosis. In adults, um, it, they tend to present with psychosis and have a better response to immunotherapy. So something to think about in your patients, if they do have um, herpes simplex encephalitis, they get worse, you want to think about testing for antibodies and considering immunotherapy in that situation. Um, I'm just going to mention a little bit about immune checkpoint inhibitors. These are a hot topic in the field of oncology. And um, immune checkpoints are useful in that they help prevent autoimmunity. But when you um, uh, inhibit those checkpoints, it increases the T cell response against the cancer. But that can also provoke autoimmunity. And here we see some of the areas that these antibodies are targeting. CTLA-4, PD-1, PDL one are some of the uh, regions that are uh, uh, targeted. Pembrolizumab is one of the ipilimumab. They're some of the medications that are used. And it's particularly useful in melanoma, but it's expanding to be used across many treatments. And there have been reports of autoimmune encephalitis. This was a patient who developed anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis after immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment. Um, and uh, there is uh, many cases in the literature of this. Here you can see another case of limbic encephalitis after immune checkpoint inhibitor use. The main treatment of this is to stop the checkpoint inhibitor. The half-life is two to four weeks. And then um, we generally give corticosteroids. And sometimes if patients are severely affected, plasma exchange, IVIG, or rituximab, and most will resolve within six to 12 weeks. And then at that point, you want to decide about the risk-benefit ratio of reinitiating the immune checkpoint inhibitors, because sometimes these patients will not survive if they don't have the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So you may need to either pre-treat or try and uh, restart the treatment, maybe a different treatment. Uh, this is a paper that we uh, just published this year. So this is a small group of patients that we recognize. So uh, in the post-transplant setting, there's many reasons for encephalopathy. Patients can have uh, encephalopathy from cyclosporin toxicity that can provoke uh, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Uh, patients can develop neoplasms, uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. Um, infections, uh, HHV6 is known to cause a limbic encephalitis in the setting of uh, uh, transplant. Uh, but we uh, uh, found uh, three patients, and there's many patients, there's probably 10 or 15 patients in the literature that have been reported with this. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive because these patients are already on immunosuppression for their transplant, but it's mostly T cell immunosuppression, and it may be something about the balance between T and B cells. It can occur months to years after transplant, and uh, it's been reported with antibodies to AMPA, NMDA, MOG, and LGI-1. Some of these patients have also had EBV uh, positivity in their CSF, um, which might suggest a post-infectious type phenomenon. And they tend to respond well to antibody uh, depleting therapy, so additional treatments in the patients that we saw, they were treated with plasma exchange, rituximab, and they tended to respond fairly well. Okay. So conclusions and future directions. So autoimmune encephalitis represents a large proportion of encephalitis that is increasing over time. There are clinical and radiological clues that can help aid the diagnosis, like facio-brachial dystonic seizures we talked about, uh, severe weight loss with DPPX, uh, psychosis, oromandibular dyskinesias with NMDA receptor antibodies. Uh, serum and CSF antibody testing are helpful, but recognize the limitations of those. And uh, we are increasingly recognizing autoimmune encephalitis in novel settings, post herpes simplex encephalitis, checkpoint inhibitor use, and even in the post-transplant setting. So I'll just acknowledge um, there is a, a, a large group of Irish neurologists at the Mayo Clinic in the autoimmune neurology group for some reason. There's 50% uh, of them are from Ireland. It's kind of one followed each other or something like that. Um, uh, that's Dr. McKeown and Dr. Piddock, and then we have many other people in our lab and people who've uh, supported some of this research. So I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you.